Hello again, everybody. This is Mr. Everything. I'm coming back at you with another Wargaming and Miniature video. In this video, we're going to continue our tutorial series on black powder. And in this video, we're going to be talking about advanced rules. Now, in these advanced rules, we're going to be talking about battalion squares, brigade squares, mixed formations, fighting from buildings. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is the battalion square. Now, black powder does encompass a variety of different years. Uh, early muskets, you know, like the French and Indian War, Marlboro Age. Later on, uh, Frederick the Great era. So it, does, it covers a wide range of, of uh, tactics. And uh, a lot of these tactics I'm going to talk about were not in use in every era. So uh, just based on which era you're going to use is which one of these rules you want to use. That's why they put them in in the advanced rules. They're not really core rules. Okay, one of them is the battalion square. Now they would, it's, it's associated with the Napoleonic period because uh, the, the Units would form square to defend themselves against cavalry. Uh, now, there are two types of squares. There's the battalion square and the brigade square. Uh, now, we're going to talk about the battalion square. Only units of regular infantry can form square. And as with any formation change, an order is required to change to form square. So, you still have to... It takes one movement, one of your three orders that you, like if you get three moves, you get to spend one move to change formation into a square. A square has four fronts and four quarters. So let's take this Dutch-Belgian line unit, and when you form square, you basically, the, the way they describe it is three figures are left on each side, but like these are not based three figures per base, they're based two figures per base. So what I'll do is I'll put four figures in the front, and then you'll just turn. All right, so what I've done is I left a little space in the middle, and I arranged my figures in a way that it's the closest I could get to a square. Now probably, I probably should have uh, left two facing to the front. That's probably exactly what I should have done. And then one facing to each side. And then two facing to the rear. And what you want to do is try to form a, a square to the best of your ability. Now I could bring this in, but you notice how that's more of a rectangle than a square. So that's not really a good formation. And you could go all the way out like this, but that winds up being more of a rectangle lengthwise. So what I what I imagine is a base in the middle of my formation, and then I take it so you can see that there is a square base in the middle of that formation. So that is a battalion square, because these uh, units represent battalions. Now, if that now remember this is with a six stand unit, which is your most common uh, standard size unit. Now, if you've got a small unit, uh, it should be fairly easy to form square in the fact that you just basically take one stand and face it on all four sides. And there's no real hole in the middle. When you, go, when you go to form square, you leave your front facing where it is, and you pull the units to the rear. So you take these guys, and you pull them off to the rear. And then you turn these to the side. And you turn these to the side. Just like that. Super easy. Now, once you're in square, infantry squares can move a maximum of one time, and then it's also at half pace. And they move automatically uh, when given an order. 
a lot like a March column. Squares cannot charge. Uh, okay, so when they're in a square, they're considered to have four front facings. And they can shoot out of every side. Uh, you shoot one die per facing. Uh, and then when they do hand-to-hand, -hand, if they were to ever do hand-to-hand, -hand, they would do two dice per facing. Remember, up to the maximum value of your unit. In hand-to-hand -hand fighting, a square gets a plus three combat result roll when fighting against cavalry. That way, uh, it's more likely that they win the combat against cavalry. Even if they take more casualties, they're adding three to their combat value, result value, meaning like let's say these guys do one casualty or two casualties and they do zero casualties, they still win because they have three versus the two that they did. Now, when fighting the cavalry, so like when the cavalry charges and or whatever, and it's it's uh, lined up to this side. So when the cavalry is fighting them, if they were actually getting attacked by infantry at the same time, that plus three modifier is actually negated. That's only they only get that plus three results if they're only fighting cavalry. And a square that has to make a break test ignores any result that causes it to retire. Basically, if, it, if it's asking the square to move back, fall back, or what have you, they just ignore it. Now, enemy cavalry are not allowed, not permitted, to charge a square unless the square is either disordered or shaken. Even determined charge cavalry, whose special rules will oblige them to charge, will not charge home into a square unless it is shaken or disordered. And cavalry ordered to do so will automatically halt three inches away. The player can use whatever move remains to ride his cavalry back or around the side of the enemy. Now cavalry that charge home into a disordered or shaken square receive no charge bonus when doing so. And it will also give that square the plus three versus cavalry. Okay, now there are some units in the Napoleonic period, almost all of them, have this rule that says must form square. If you have a unit that must form square, which is pretty much all of them, uh, you'll just have to take a look. Unengaged units that have the form square special rule can and must attempt to form square when charged to their front by enemy cavalry, even if disordered. This doesn't apply to units already engaging the enemy to their side or rear. Troops with a form square rule have no choice in the matter. Now the only exception is when infantry might be occupying a defensible position, like if there was some kind of a battlement or a wall or something like that. If they're defending some kind of position, they don't have to form square. If they're not in a defensible position and they're charged in the front, they must roll. And what you do is you roll two dice. That's why I got the two dice here. Roll two dice and add the scores together. On a roll of double six, on a score of double six, the unit is disordered. But it can still form into square. But because it's disordered, the enemy can charge home as described. Now, on a roll of double one, the unit is not only disordered, but cannot form square and must receive the charge. But what happens when you roll non-double ones or non-double sixes? Then they just form square. They're not disordered. If you roll double sixes, they become disordered and form square. If you roll double ones, they're disordered as well, and they don't form square. Now, a unit that forms square as a response to a cavalry charge cannot also deliver closing fire because they're, you know, they're busy forming the square, so they have no time to shoot. This battalion is sitting right here, and this cavalry says, I want to charge that infantry, right? So I, I shake my dice, I roll it. It's not double ones, it's not double sixes, I'm not disordered, I just form square, right? And so 
we back this up. All right, so we form square, and these guys, on their move, they would stop at three inches, and it, let's say that took two inches. Now they would still have the rest of their move to either turn and maybe go to the sides. Okay, now let's talk about brigade squares. A brigade square is a much larger organization. It's when you have four units and each unit has formed line on each side. So we're going to put a unit here in line. When I say a gap, I mean you're not uh, you're not overlapping your uh, infantry. They actually extend out past each other's line. So you would get you would get these little triangles on the on the corners there. And then historically, what you would have is your baggage train and your officers and things like that would be in the center. Each one of these being a brigade or a battalion, and then this is the brigade square. Um, if you had artillery pieces, you could put them on the ends here, and they could um, fire out the corners. Units can be formed in a brigade square simply by moving them into position. It is not a chain formation. So each unit would move just like they would normally move, and whoa, and they would just get into position. And once you get into this position, you're considered in brigade square. Now, a brigade square can have other units with its, within its entire, uh, you know, you can have friendlies inside there. And units in brigade square do not present flanks to enemy attack. So, like, if this unit was to get charged, it doesn't actually get charged into the flank uh, like that because there is no flank to charge into when you're in this formation. Basically considers them to be covered up. All units in Brigade Square count as having both flanks and rear supported. So you get that plus three to uh, your combat bonus results. And a brigade square can comprise of troops from several different brigades. So maybe there was a Dutch-Belgian brigade and a British and Brunswick brigade. Or maybe there was a British brigade, a Brunswick brigade, and a Dutch-Belgian brigade. And they got into this formation. They would still be considered a brigade square. Now once given an order, the brigade square is free to move as the player wishes. It is not restricted in the way of the battalion square because basically this unit would be moving all by itself, this unit would be moving by itself, this unit would be moving by itself, and that unit would be moving by itself. And then units in the center of the square, like if you had friendly units inside the square, they would be free to move out of the square without breaking formation. Now, a unit in a brigade square that takes a break test ignores results that oblige it to retire. There's nowhere to run. It's all going back into the center of the square. And note that units in Brigade Square shoot and fight the same way as if they were in line formation, just like they are. All right, and so that's a Brigade Square. It's very odd, and you can see it takes up a lot of space on the table. Um, I don't foresee very many player generals using that formation, but it is a possibility. All right, so let's go. Next thing is rules for fighting from a building. Okay, I got a couple of different building models out here to kind of represent the different ways that uh, buildings are handled. Okay, now both of these buildings have removable roofs. But if I was to try to occupy this building with this unit, there's no way that I'm going to pull this roof off and put all these figures down inside that building. It's just not going to happen, right? And then you don't even really need to do that. Buildings are normally considered to be on a 12 inch by 12 inch board. So if you had, or if you want to, uh, distinguish the built up area, I'm going to call it a built up area. It's not just one building. You can put walls around it, you could put fences, and what you're trying to do is make an area around this building that's, and you could do it on a board, you could put a little hedge around, you could put a fence, a wall, or whatever, 
this whole area there is really technically considered the building. And when you deploy inside the building, you put your troops in facing in every direction pretty much. And you don't have to you don't have to have them facing you know perfect in every direction you know but they're basically something like that maybe there's a fence line on this side maybe this so this is considered the built up area and you can make it bigger and smaller depending on how you want to do it so now that is con they are considered fighting from the building because remember that black powder is not uh, a man-to-man -man game this is a unit of guys that are probably five, six hundred men, not just 16. And so what that couldn't possibly be, just one building. So this is a building, we'll call it a sector or a building, a built up area. And so every one of these guys are technically in a building. But having the one building model there and the fences makes it look good. Now, a unit of small medium okay small medium or large size add a couple more bases can fit in a built up area right so you can put a large group in there you can put a medium or a small group uh, if you have a tiny unit then you could put a tiny unit and an artillery piece in a built up area now, units in a building are not in any real formation, and they're considered to be fighting out of all four sides. So kind of think of them a little bit like they're in a square. They can shoot out of each side of the building, and they can melee out of each side of the building. Uh, they can shoot two dice per side, and... They can hand-to-hand -hand two dice per side. And tiny units and cannons fight and shoot with their normal values. Now, if this unit has three dice of shooting, it can shoot two dice out of this side, remember. But now it cannot shoot an additional two dice out of that side because that would be a total of four, and you can only shoot a total of three. Same thing when it does combat. If it does two dice of fighting out of this side, it can do two dice out of this side and two dice out of that side, but then this guy can't actually do any fighting. Or he just can't roll any dice. He can fight, but he'll just take it. And again, units in a building, they have to make a break test, ignore any results that would cause them to withdraw, uh, They because they're just withdrawing deeper into the buildings. Okay, now, uh, buildings become really important objectives to hold, because you, your units inside of a building receive a plus two morale. Okay, now people say, oh, that's good for break tests. No, that's not what it's talking about. Morale is your saving throw versus casualties. So if you normally have a four plus save, in a building you've got a two plus save. Remember, ones are always going to fail. But uh, so you, when you roll, you're always going to save on a two or better. You're going to save all your hits. Okay, let's back up. That plus two morale save uh, actually applies to both shooting and combat. And then in hand to hand, once the fighting, once you make your results and you figure it out, the results bonus is plus one. It could be plus one, plus two, or plus three to your result. So standard and large get the plus three, uh, smalls get the plus two, and tinies get a plus one to their results. So what, what does that mean, really? Well, let's say these Dutch Belgians come up and they charge in and they're attacking these guys. And uh, these guys, this is considered a standard size unit. This is a standard size unit. Let's say, okay, let's talk about this just a little bit. To be able to engage in hand-to-hand -hand or to charge in hand-to-hand, -hand, the Dutch Belgians had to have had enough movement to get to the town sector 
as well as six additional inches. If you had additional six inches, then basically they're fighting over the wall and they're able, they're able to um, fight into the town. So let's say this guy charges into this building. This guy gets to melee with his full six dice. But these guys are only going to get to melee with two dice, right? Because those are the two guys presenting themselves to that side of the building. Let's say, hypothetically, this guy gets all three hits, or, or he, gets, he gets four hits, let's say. Um, that's quite a bit of hits. Hell, let's just say he scored all six hits. Let's go crazy. He scored all six hits. And let's say he scored half of his hits, because that is what the odds are. So he scores one hit against them. Let's say they save, so they actually take no damage, right? And let's say just these guys are going to be rolling six times, but be, and it's normally four or better, but because they're in a building, it's two better than that, so it's two or better. So here we go. Let's see if I can roll any twos or better. Everything but one. So he takes one casualty, right, out of that whole thing, and we just assume they took no casualties. All right, so how do you determine who wins this fight? You're thinking they're winning because they did it casually. Well, that's not true. Because this is a standard size unit, they get plus three to their results. So they've actually lost. So they make a break test. It's crazy, right? Look at that. That's insane. All right. Now, there's another alternative to the building. Let me move this. Okay, so there's another alternative to the buildings. Uh, this is... This is a scratch built building that I made myself where you don't need the uh, town squares or whatever. The building is large enough to represent its own sector uh, because you can actually open the building up and put an entire unit inside. As long as you can fit an entire large size unit into your building, then the building model is big enough to represent its own town sector. It doesn't matter which way you face them, because, you know, it just looks better if they're looking all out the windows and stuff. So there. So you get an entire building inside of a in it, I mean, I'm sorry. You get an entire unit inside of a building, then you don't have to have that uh, extremi extraneous uh, walls and stuff like that. But because this building it looks nice, but it's tiny and there's no way to fit a whole unit in here, you need to put those outside walls. Fighting is conducted the exact same way. All right, next thing we're talking about is mixed formation. Uh, there are certain units in the Napoleonic period, which is almost all of the line and light infantry, that have the capability of forming a mixed formation. And what that means is as simple as this. You change formation, you take one-third of your figures, which in this case with six stands, I'm going to take two stands, this stand, and this stand, you always take the two end stands, and you put them in front, and they represent your skirmishers. Now, what I've done is I've mounted two figures per skirmisher stand, so you got your skirmishers out front like that, basically leaving a space in between each of your stands. If you don't have them mounted like this, okay, so you have a unit in column. Uh, you want to go ahead and deploy skirmishers with your column or line. You take one third of your models and you put them out front. And again, you just leave them about a base width in between. And this is all this is doing is it's representing that there are skirmishers out front. Yeah, you want to keep them within two inches of each other, which is about a base, and less than six inches in front. So you don't want to put them way out, way out in front. You want to keep them within about six inches. So if the British were in line and not column... Oh, let, let's back up. Now, all it does is take a formation change or one movement to bring them out. Uh, to bring them back in, it only takes one... You just roll. If you get one move, you can withdraw your skirmishers back into column, and then you can continue moving. Or you can do whatever, you know. Uh, 
if you're in line, it still only takes one move. Okay. Those flags, man. Those flags. <laughs> Let me put my flankers there. Okay, so when you deploy your skirmishers, you just take one from each side. You put it in front. Again, keeping them within about two inches of each other and no more than six inches in front of the unit. That's how you deploy your skirmishers. Now, why would you bother forming a mixed formation? The unit is treated as a whole, and the entire formation occupies the area deline delineated by the line and skirmish troops. This is not two separate formations. This is one formation. The front, side, and rear quarters of a mixed formation are worked out by the line. So this is where the sides would be, this is where the front would be, that's where the rear would be. These guys are kind of invisible in that case. All shooting is calculated from the skirmishers. The line doesn't shoot at all. Now the skirmishers have a 360 degree shooting and visibility. You measure the range from any model, not from the center of the main line unit, because they're not the ones shooting. Enemy fire directed against the front of the mixed unit is counted as if it's shooting at skirmishers. Now, shots that come from the side or rear have no effect. I mean, aren't modified by the fact that they're in skirmishers. So a unit that's charged from any direction by any foe, the skirmishers automatically rejoin the unit. I've got my skirmishers deployed, and I've got these Jaegers, which are primarily skirmishers, but let's just say I got these Jaegers in, formed, in a formed unit, and they go to charge in on the British here. And they have enough move to contact the skirmishers. The Remember, the skirmishers are obliged to reform. Now, what if they don't have enough move to reach the line? Well, that's okay. The skirmish, they, what they did was they got rid of the skirmishers, right? They charged in, that's as far as they could reach. The skirmishers had to form back, but now they're, they, don't, they don't reach. Now, there are times when you don't want to charge the main line. You just want to get rid of the skirmishers. So as a general, you have to command your units when you give them the orders. You say, charge the skirmish line, and when they reform, halt. Now, a mixed order formation that's charged has all of the charge response options it would normally have if it was in line or attack column. So. If I had 12 inches of charging, I charge forward, they're in a mixed formation, right? Blah, like that, right? So I say, I'm going to charge. I charge in, these guys reform, and these guys make contact. They can do a, a hold or they could do a stand and shoot. And that's basically mixed order formation. Um, and that's why when I take my brigades here, my battalions, I take approximately one-third of them and I put them in skirmish option. That way, let's say, the, and in a four-figure, because your attack column is going to be two bases wide, so that's basically an attack column. So these guys form, I, what I would do is I would just, well, actually the flag should probably be in the front. I don't think I would form like that. You know, I would just leave it like this or like this with these guys up front. Because, you know, when they reform, they're just going to run back and jump into that little hole that's vacant. Right. What I need to do is rebase a couple of these because I have no skirmishers in this unit. But like this has got two skirmishers. This has got the two skirmishers. This... This actually has four skirmishers. I actually did, a, because it's a large enough unit, I went ahead and did an exactly one-third amount of figures, which is two bases. All right, guys. Well, thanks for coming out and checking out this video on the advanced rules for squares, battalion squares, and brigade squares, as well as 
occupying a building, and mixed formations. All right, now our next video is going to be about commanders and unit special abilities. All right, I'll catch you then.